I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. So, because I can't see you, right? Who's in my seat? I'm in your seat, Nicola. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> well, I was up until two seconds ago. <laughs> then I got moved. And he turfed you, Eamon, did he? No, it was Claude who pulled the strings there. Oh. So. Anyway, I'll, you, can only, you can have it for today, all right? Okay, uh, that's okay. It's just, I, I look quite small in it, actually, is my only concern. But other than that, thank you. All right. You're always concerned about your height in the <laughs> studio. Uh, does it keep you awake at night? It doesn't. It doesn't, Nicola. I sleep yeah. like a baby. <laughs> up every four hours looking for a bottle. Yeah. Yeah. So how was things back at home? They're fantastic, yeah. Beautiful weather, you know. What about Amsterdam? Yeah. Have you been? Yeah, it was fabulous weather. Really nice. Um, drank a few glasses of wine. Enjoyed yeah. looking around the city. Uh, did a little bit of work as well. Yeah. So um, I hit Amsterdam on Sunday, sort of late afternoon, because the Marengo trial was on Monday. We wanted to be there, you know, to get out to the bunker, you know, when you don't know where you're going and all that. So it's yeah. fussy. But anyway, um, it seemed to be, it's only 20 minutes from the city centre yeah. where the bunker place is. Um, and Jan Mayas, who's one of our colleagues out there in NRC, he very kindly agreed to meet us outside and went in with us and introduced us to everybody and all the rest. But it's a really strange setup because, um, so we're talking about the bunker, the bunker. We're expecting that to be sort of some sort of a military style shelter or an underground yeah. sort of a building. But in actual fact, it is it was formerly a raincoat factory. Right. So it's not okay. so it's, <laughs> like, yeah, because I always presumed it was sort of a World War Two kind of concrete bunker. No, yeah, it's so no, it's so weird. And it's in an industrial estate. So it's down this kind of, you know, when you go into these industrial estates and you get to a kind of a cul-de-sac-y end bit. Now, you can actually you can go past it and around the corner, come to think of it as well. There's maybe one or two other factories past it. But so it's kind of normal business is going on in this industrial estate while this trial has been held and has been held for the last three years. Um, there is what you and I would call meatheads right, right. outside on every corner, uh, both military and armed police now very heavily armed and all flak jackets, helmets, everything. And they're all around the entrances and they're outside. There's drones in the air. Um, but yet it just feels so unsuitable because it's happening in a place where, uh, like opposite it, there was a car repair place. You know, it looked like the NCT yeah. building. And there was quite a lot of cars and people coming in and out, literally across the road from it, despite all this security. Um, they are building a purpose-built courtroom for cases to do with organised crime out at, I gather it's at that Vucht prison, where which is their high security prison, so they're not going to have to take the convicts across Amsterdam and into this you know, totally unpurpose built arena where the trials have been going on So, uh, but that's going to take a while before it's built Yeah, um, yeah it's... So in the meantime it's going to be in the bunker so I suppose it's it's like the Regency, like for all of that, the, the high powered uh, policing of it and all the intelligence and all the guys, the ERU outside with, with, with machine guns. And then you go into the courtroom and then there's the surreal bit where you bumped into, I kept bumping into Paul Murphy as he was yeah. leaving the coffee shop to go into the trial. So it's just, it's, it, it's, there's a disconnect. But it's something much there's something much safer about that Regency trial, actually. And having just come from that into this, it feels so different. Um, it's like, so going into the building called the bunker, you go up these steps and it's like, you know, when you're going into a bank and the doors have to close before another one opens. So only one person at a time can go through these series of doors. 
And then you have to go through a kind of an airport screening and, um, you know, get your ID checked. There is armed military manning all of that area. And you eventually kind of get your your gear back after it's been placed through the security and monitored for everything. And you're then inside. And once you're inside, there's nothing like that going on. There's no members of the public floating around. You literally have to be, you have to get accreditation to go along to it. Now, there was 21 journalists there the other day, plus ourselves, um, from all sorts of media, TV and uh, newspaper, radio and that kind of thing. Um, Jan Mayus was there and Saskia Bellman, who's been on quite a few times. She was there as well. Um, and none of the suspects were there except Taggy came in on video link. So all that security that was in place was to secure the judiciary. Wow. And the lawyers, yeah. So it's just amazing. Nick, now, Nicola, it was... Sorry. Yeah. Just, which, what you were describing there, all that kind of really high security, I, I noticed then in some of the previous... Um, uh, uh, speeches that were put forward or evidence that was put forward by the prosecution, they kind of mentioned, they gestured to these empty seats that have been reserved for the family members of of the of the victims. And apparently they were saying that none of them have ever turned up. Is that, is that do you think that kind of heavy security would be so off-putting to kind of, to somebody, you know, as not to mention the threat from the gangs, but the actual security itself is, is scaring people away? I think they're just afraid the families uh, of the victims, that's, that seems to be the case, that they are afraid. Now, apparently at the very beginning of this trial, some members of Taggy's wider family came and protested outside this building, but they haven't been since. Um, and although he was on video screen this week, uh, usually the 16 of them plus himself are in the courtroom with their back to the media. Now, between the courtroom and the media, there is, you sit in what is a really clinical, kind of like a classroom. It feels like a classroom. And there's press officers from the court there. And there's just, uh, you know, windows with blinds down. And just as the court starts, the blinds go up. So we're behind glass. You know, it's, it's most peculiar, the whole setup. Never seen anything like it. But I think people are afraid to go. I think nobody wants to be associated with it. Um, and the journalists are even... They're wary, are they? Attitude. Yeah, they're doing it. They're doing their job. But they all sort of say the same thing, that they, they hope they're just a face in the crowd and they hope that there's a bit of safety in numbers. And... It's kind of a sense of they're hoping for the best. Yeah. You know, which is covering this thing, but anything could happen. Which is crazy, like, because, like, it's such an ordered society, isn't it, over there in such a beautiful yeah. city, even though there's, you know, sort of wild aspects to it. But even that wildness feels kind of safe when you're over there, you know? It's just that, 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 that they're inspiring that danger is something else. Funny enough, I haven't been for a while to Amsterdam and I thought, I think it's got much uh, less seedy and, and that sort of edge to it isn't quite what it was when I was last there. No. You know, walked around all the red light district and okay, there's a couple of ravers out in the street on a Sunday night, you know, probably taking ecstasy pills or whatever, having a bit of a, a boogie. Um, the red light district is what it is. You know, it's seedy, it's full of stag parties, but it does feel a lot of police out in the streets. It feels very safe. Yeah, it's more like it seems almost like a tourist attraction rather than uh, like some sort of crazy out of control bit of the, bit of the Europe, you know. Yeah, that's. Do you know what? It's like a giant big temple bar, yeah. except there's women standing in the windows. Redly, you know what I mean? It's just it. It is a lot of people just walk through that just to see it, you know. Um. So that's sort of all there, and yeah, look. The Netherlands is a very rich country. Amsterdam is a very rich city. They pay a lot of tax, but there's no very little homeless people on the streets. Um, there are certainly people in these coffee shops. The waft, the weed coming out of them is kind of sickening, actually, the smell of it everywhere. But there's nobody falling around the place. I mean, it doesn't have that same sense of sometimes 
Dublin can be a scary place at night. Everybody's drunk and there's rows breaking out and that kind of thing. Amsterdam is just a little bit more sophisticated, I think, than that. And yet you have this massive big underbelly of organised crime and, and what's created this situation with Taggy. Um, but it's it's interesting, the attitude towards him. And of course, the, the proceedings, it was the best day to go because it could be the last time he's seen. Um, he has looked, because his lawyer was arrested, she's been released without charge, Inez Wesky. Um, she can no longer represent him. And what he did there the other day, of course, I don't understand Dutch, but you can understand the reaction of the journalists around us. The court proceedings got underway. There's three judges there, a bit like our special criminal court. And they've an extra judge in case any of the three gets sick so somebody can stand in. This thing, the last thing they want is any more delay with it. It's been cursed from the beginning with COVID and, you know, it just really started up before then. Um, but, the, but the other day, Taggy managed to get the court to agree that he could discuss in camera um, what he wants to do next, whether or not he has legal representatives. So the journalists were, you know, as you could see, sort of the judges were making a bit of a ruling in Dutch, but you could hear all the journalists tutting, throwing their eyes up to heaven, you know, throwing their notebooks on the table, cross, and and then the proceedings come to an end. And uh, they, of course, they've all fabulous English, so they translate for me that Taggy has won this ruling to go in camera. And so I'm chatting to them then afterwards, and of course, we, we go back into the court at the end of it to, to, to hear what's happening next. And uh, we're back in that situation that the shutters come up and we're behind the glass into the courtroom. But, um, you know, I was looking at Taggy on the screen. He's got quite, <laughs> now it's going to laugh at me here, <laughs> but he's got quite, you know, his face is filled out. I'm going to fat shame rid of <laughs> Taggy. Yeah. Might as well. I fat shamed everybody else. Yeah, you really have. But anyway, he has got quite fuller faced. He's a, a beard. He's quite well groomed. Um, he is smug looking. He's sitting there, sitting back into his chair when he won this ruling that he was arguing for the in-camera hearing with the judges. He big smile broke out in his face and he gave the thumbs up to the camera like that, you know. Yeah. Um, and the court sketch artists, who, they're always great people to talk to in courts the, the the artists because they're really not listening they're just looking at the faces aren't they and I said to the, this guy like what what did you think of have you drawn him before Taggy what did you think of him and he said he said today he has on his game face yeah so he's rep- you know after all that's happening he's still playing games he's still trying to work the system manipulate the system use it you know find loopholes find ways of agitating so he's totally representing himself now at this point despite well all. he's he can't apparently find a lawyer so this is what he told the judges in the in camera um can't find a lawyer just for the moment so he's gonna have a little look around and see if he can get a lawyer so he's just delayed it another bit they were expecting this to come to an end there was to be closing speeches in the next couple of weeks and um there was to be uh, a judgment in October but they now reckon it's going to be kicked on into next year and um, nobody's under any illusion but that any of them that would bet money on it he's going down he's guilty you know because they said the evidence is so strong against him this isn't a, a regency trial where any of the journalists are questioning the state's case it looks to them to be pretty strong the case they'd be very surprised if he's found not guilty um but this delay 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 he seems to have boundless energies um now i found it peculiar because the delay of course is because the police arrested his lawyer you know Zweski, and i was like well why didn't they wait this wasn't an arrest for anything imminent this was an arrest you know to quiz her they believe, they suspect that she was passing information out to the outside or, you, you know, passing information to Taggy. She denied that vociferously. She's had a 30, 40 year career. There's never been any suggestion of any of this 
happening before, even though she's represented, you know, huge with criminals. Um, so, you know, either they've got that wrong and she hasn't done that. Or, you know, if she did, why didn't they just wait until they wouldn't be disrupting this case again? I, I don't get it. Now, there's an incredible story, which I will save for my podcast, but that Jan May has told me, um, which is just, I mean, to say it's like a movie plot, they'd run you out of Hollywood with this one. But that's something that has happened, which he believes is the reason they they did arrest her so quickly. It's just extraordinary. It's one of these cases and one of these stories that seems to attract all these subplots around it. Yeah, it's because the stakes are so high, I suppose. Um, and do do the journalists there, do they feel like if he is convicted and put away that this will be a landmark moment? Or do they just feel that it's just going to go on and on? The situation they're in I think they feel scared to be honest with you and I'm not sure they believe like I suppose when he was arrested in Dubai and sent home to go on trial to be you know to be held and booked prison and all the rest of it that might have been the moment they thought this was at its end but of course that was just the beginning in one way because he suspected since he was returned home or just, sorry, before he came home, the uh, criminal lawyer was shot. For them, that was just this absolute Veronica Guerin moment. Um, and of course, then the state witness's brother was shot. And then, uh, you know, the most, the very, very famous uh, journalist, Peter DeVries, was murdered and all suspected of being on the order of Taggy. So, I think they sort of feel, can he be tamed? Can he be brought to justice in any way? Um, Whether he's convicted or not. Whether he's he's convicted or not, exactly. And you're like, their colleagues are are under threat. Their colleagues, a a number of them, are living with 24-hour security, like literally with police escorts, um, having to give details of their week's plans a week in advance so you know if they're going to meet somebody the route can be checked in advance you know the place can be um i mean that's really heavy threat to be under and um so it's very real for them like and it hasn't abated despite the fact that he's supposed to be you know he's locked up 23 hours a day he's just and then I ask them, like, is he unique or is there more taggies out there? And there is. And there seems to be. They're coming up, they believe. Um, like the justice minister in Belgium, which is just the neighbouring country, which I came down to Antwerp after Amsterdam, um, the main entry point, one of the main entry points into Europe for cocaine. Uh But in Belgium, the justice minister, they uncovered a plot to kidnap the justice minister by an underling of Taggy. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 stunning, really, isn't it? I mean, yeah, like, you know, just their their targeting of people in civil society is just unprecedented. I mean, we just have not had that here, really, beyond one or two incidents it just hasn't happened in Ireland. I was going to say because I was when I was been following the Taggy Domingo trial. Um, mm. I was often wondering, like, what's it going to be like if we have Christy Kinnahan Senior or Daniel Kinnahan Senior here on trial, and are there lessons to learn? But from what you're saying, while Amsterdam may be the more sophisticated place to go out at night on Saturday nights, that they haven't had these challenges. Where in Ireland we've had the special criminal court, you know, since the early '80s, you know, for more than thirty years. And that we probably have a better track record of, of dealing with extremely dangerous people and dangerous criminals, or maybe because it's a smaller country for, for whatever reason. I, you know, it sounds like it's really challenged the the kind of the the rule of law. Well, Ireland had Ireland. subversives, of course. You know, that is subversive. There's a there was a war here with subversive forces, like you know, IRA. I know the IRA acted differently in the Republic than it did in the North of Ireland, but. You know, there was some sort of structures there in, in, in how to deal with these 
groups, but, it, but it I mean, does it sound like we're we're actually more resilient here than the Dutch at this stage. That we've nearly more experience. Is that but is I that a fair characterization? Do you think? Or? It, it would feel more comfortable, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think if we were more capable and and but but like there is a sense that these guys and and his organization tagging. You know, I think the difference is. Um, and you'd probably need somebody with more experience, almost military experience on this. But for me, the difference is when they brought Taggy back, his organization in the Netherlands was still very powerful. It hadn't been dismantled. So they brought him back and he had access or he he certainly got it through very, you know, sneaky means by um having a, a relative of his was a lawyer and the, during their private meetings, it was believed the guy had been jailed in relation to it, that uh, he was passing messages and, and giving directions to him that way. But he did have, I think in Ireland, and I hope we've done it right in that the Kinahan organization has as such been dismantled before, if we, if we consider that Daniel Kinahan may be coming home. Um, I wonder how the jail system will operate with it like if Kinahan is back will it make any difference or um, you know he'll have a lot of friends in jail I suppose and a, a lot of gang members how will they behave to him um, they talk about in the Netherlands as well at what point does that support network under Taggy break and do they decide actually this guy is ahead the ball yeah. even we don't want him you know he's causing so much trouble for all of us um, you know, these guys do usually implode and the gangs implode because they're so out of control. But, um, yeah, you'd like to think Ireland has more experience. I think we get, you know, we criticise the cops a lot, but I do think they're a good police force. And I think they've done an amazing job dismantling that Kinahan organisation so far and probably keeping a lid on things, touch wood, Um as regards their capabilities in Ireland. But yeah, the Netherlands brought him back. And at one point, I think they had estimated his gang was 200 strong, you know, in, in Amsterdam and in Utrecht, where he had, had come out of. So that was definitely a big problem. Yeah, I mean, it's a narco-terrorist organisation, isn't it? Which is a different matter, really. Like, you know, they behave, mm. they are obviously f- drug funded but they behave they seem to behave like a, a terrorist organization at war with the state you know yeah is, remember the case there was a head left in a bucket and yeah. the torture yeah. chambers buried underground it was a whole new level i think yeah. and, than what we're used to in, in, in fairness to the dutch and also um what they say is and saskia bellman has said this to me and she she said it again there the other day that um the police didn't really know taggy They had no much intelligence on him. You know, he sort of exploded out of nowhere. Uh, All of a sudden, he's massive. He's sitting at Daniel Kinahan's wedding um, and he's part of the European cocaine cartel. So they didn't have much of a knowledge on him. I do think in Ireland, we, you know, the police have really good intelligence on Daniel Kinahan, what makes him tick, uh, you know, who his network are. So they know all that. The Dutch were on the back foot a bit. Yeah, it's probably a, an, an immigrant population that he's coming from as well, which has proven more difficult for police intelligence in, in many countries to 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 get an in within, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a more, there tends to be a more liberal system. I know from in the past we covered some Irish criminals that would have been caught in, in Holland and Belgium. And they would generally get much, much lighter sentences that time on remand counts as double time. And this sort of thing. So they, even if they were convicted of serious charges, they might only serve a single digit. You know, they might only serve a three or four year sentence that in Ireland will be getting closer to 14 or 15 years, which I'm sure helps people. Um, you, you know, it, it keeps them in line in terms of in a criminal gang. If you know the boss is going to get out in five years rather than 15 years, you're going to have a different attitude, I think. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so. Yeah, anyway, listen, there's loads there to, to for us to have a look at and to consider um, at more length. I popped down to Antwerp as well to have a look at the port and to talk to another colleague of ours there in relation to the entry point. Antwerp is interesting, actually, because uh, it's a population of 
six or seven hundred thousand. It's got this huge big port. I don't have the figures to hand about how much stuff comes in there, but the the gangs that are operating in Antwerp are sort of, you know, they have been generations in the smuggling game. And they see themselves almost as business people. There's very little sort of gangland murders in Belgium or in, in Antwerp, despite the levels of criminality that must exist. Um, they're sort of business people and they they have their tentacles, the corruption right into the ports and, and all the rest of it. Um, but it's all to do with the, the cocaine coming in on the fruit ships from Colombia, South America, Central America. Um, and it's the entry point for fruit into Europe, Antwerp. So all our bananas and everything else like that uh, that we eat is stored, is brought in through Antwerp, stored in refrigeration. And if you can imagine how much fruit Europe consumes, um, there's plenty of opportunities for them to hide the cocaine, you know. Uh, Joris van der Rae, who works in Antwerp, the journalist, the crime journalist, one of our colleagues there was showing me um, a place where they 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 washed like engines or something, and you needed this special material to wash the engines, and it was imported. Uh, it was imported from South America. It's discovered, of course, they were just shipping hundreds of tons of cocaine through there. The actual business that was set up didn't really exist. They didn't obviously want this uh, this chemical used to clean the things that was just a total front. It reminds me down in Antwerp in the port. Did you see The Wire? Saw The Wire, yeah. Season two, is yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly like that. Exactly like that. Um, and lots of people working. I mean, tens of thousands of people working in the port, you know. Um, and all on probably an average wage. Uh, the gangs... There, there's been quite a bit of stuff has come before the courts in Antwerp relating to the Sky ECC hack, which was after EncroChat. And this system was used by a lot of Belgian criminals. Um, so the case is coming before the courts have heard evidence that the gangs based in Antwerp had built intelligence on uh, lots of people including actually some of the journalists that cover the court cases. But th- what they had done was they had they had got basically files and files and files of people working in the port and a bit of information about them. They'd even found out some of them, what the uh, how much mortgages they had to pay back. They'd been able to get into the banking systems through corruption there. They could see if somebody was in debt. Um, and they were using that to narrow down who to target to corrupt Wow. Because they prefer to um they prefer to have somebody kind of willingly working for them rather than threatening them. I mean it's huge money, of course, isn't it? When you when you see how much they're bring it in, like I mean, even a tiny percentage of that, you know, is a huge amount. Um and it's yeah. you know, when people are being paid quite little, you can see how they could be corrupted. And, and, and literally, it's so as people can people can phone them. You probably saw those scenarios of the wire that you know that they were able to uh, facilitate the moving of the containers with the drugs on into a different part of the port, so they could come collect it and just drive off with it. Yeah, and and it's it's not, it's not remote from Ireland, even though you're in you're in Rotterdam or Antwerp. Um, even just last month, we did the story. If you remember, on on um, Anthony Terry, who was running a transport business out of out of the UK, and it was it was, it was a UK case. But the the drugs were collected on the the Hook of Holland, which is on the other side of the estuary from Rotterdam, and went straight through there through Belfast. And there was there was deliveries made then into Wicklow and Limerick. So you have a direct link from where you are, Nicola, to, you know, the back yeah. streets of, of Ireland or wherever people are buying their cocaine. And don't forget as well, Christy Kinnan Sr. Um, served a jail sentence for, for doing what you, what you were talking about there for, you know, bribing two police officers. You know, he was, in, yeah. he was good at that. So, I mean, he was, you know, when was that? He finished his sentence in 2010, I think, or two, sorry, 2013. He got out of prison in, in Belgium for that. So, you know, these, these gangs, you know, like the likes of Taggy, and Kinhan, they've been at this for years. I mean, they really, they've gotten good at it by the sounds of it. 100%. And, you know, Christy Kinahan lived in Antwerp 
he had a property, a house. He lived there with a, a woman. I don't think it's the lady he's with now, but a previous partner or wife. Um, and he had bought a kind of an old casino thing that he was going to turn into something. But um, interestingly, Antwerp is the diamond capital of Europe and like historically has been. So it is like the as important a city in all of this as Amsterdam, because, of course, it's the money laundering capital of Europe as well as being the port. And what goes on in that diamond district, you could just you can nearly there's nearly a, a sort of a whiff of sulfur there. You can it's it's quite extraordinary, the diamond district. It's just uh, there's a feeling in it, there's a sense, there's an edge, like you can just imagine the deals are being done every day. And what better way to launder your funds than through d- diamonds, you know, um, and move them. And they're all still at that. And a name that came up as one of the one of the criminals who had been registered way back at the turn of the century in Antwerp dealing with the diamond dealers was, of course, George the Penguin Mitchell. Um, and he was under surveillance here way back. So himself and Christy Kinahan, like, they were ahead of the game. Yeah. And that's why they got so big, you know. They were ahead of the game. They were sophisticated. They weren't... Uh, making millions and going off and blowing it on holidays, fast cars and, and Rolex watches. They were actually business people. That that actually uh, brings me back to my first trip to Amsterdam, which was in 2000 yeah. and Derek Maradona Dunn was shot dead. And at the time, his his uh, partner was um, uh, Rachel, the Rachel Mitchell, the daughter of the Penguin. Um, and they obviously were there for, well, certainly Maradona Dunn was there for business, as was as was the Penguin. And of course, he was shot dead, and it turns out it was a fairly minor row he was having with some local criminals, and unfortunately, he was, he was killed. But it was it was mm. quite an eye opener. I mean, even the way the police, I think, treated it at the time. Like I, I arrived the day after the murder, and there was no sense of like forensics hard at work. Like you, you could walk up and look in the door, and you know that the puddles of blood and brain matter, I think, were still stuck to the wall. And it was very much, uh, you know, look, oh, this kind of stuff goes on. It's just criminals killing each other. And that was the attitude mm. that, that I certainly picked up at the time. So it's possibly it's come back to bite them a bit that they've gotten so used to, to turning a blind eye to the likes of blood diamonds or illegally mined precious metals from the, the likes of the Congo and places like that, that, um, you, you know, it's made it attractive for, for the cocaine smugglers to base themselves there. And, and it's come back to bite them. Yeah, but you see as well how important the movement of money is is to that business. Like it's it's like the drugs are one thing, but the movement of money and the ways in which to move that and the inventiveness that that requires and all of the the, the thought that has to go into that. Like it, it is quite incredible really, isn't it? Because we only generally just think of the drugs, getting the drugs to the customers, but the whole return, that whole other side of that business is is... I mean, obviously you were in court this week, Eamon, for like, that was a... That was know, a very neat segue there, Niall, I must yeah, say. Yeah, well, well, but I mean, it was an interesting... Uh, yeah. It was an interesting... That was really smooth. Yeah, they well, good at this. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was not, um, they weren't buying diamonds, but they were buying uh, bags of designer yeah, clothes. Louis, Louis Vuitton and, and Prada and these things, which apparently are much sought after designer designer labels. But yeah, look. What's this th- about? Tell me, tell me, tell me. This is um, this is a, it's a case that's been on the the cab list for the last couple of months, and I was never really sure what it was about. And it was there's 13 Chinese individuals, uh, were listed, but um, so that the case was was opened in as regards three of the individuals this week, um, and it turns out that it was a basically a Chinese organized crime gang operating in Dublin, and they were laundering money for uh, a person that has long-standing connections with Christy Kinnan Sr. Now, he was named in court as Kieran O'Sullivan um, and that they were, they were, they were laundering uh, cash for Irish drug gangs. And that's, that's how it was stated in court. Um, and they, they talked that there was a number of ways that they were doing this. And this idea of re-exporting um, high-value goods was, was one way of doing it. They're claiming that the money was being sent from China uh, there was something like 230,000 uh, euro found in the Marian Vaults, which was was tracked back to one of the people that was was that was uh, 
the action was against in court this week. Um, and they were they were talking about this system of Daigu, it was, it's called, which is basically, to try and explain it, is a surrogate shopping. So, for instance, you're living in, in, in China and you want to buy a Louis Vuitton bag and also a load of baby formula, or this is the type of stuff that, you know, the Chinese community are, are, are you know, looking for. Want, want, want to get because it is expensive or it's hard to get because I know they've had problems with baby formula being uh, sort of counterfeited and children dying. So the idea then is that you're able to go to somebody in your hometown and hand over the money, and then somebody in Ireland goes into Brown Thomas, not to buy the baby phone, but certainly to buy the Louis Vuitton bags, and then it gets couriered back to you, and money doesn't actually change borders. So the Irish gangs were feeding into this, no more than the Halawi system that you know we've talked mm. about before. Uh, and there seemed to be a huge amount of money. Like they, they, they were, it, it, it was, uh, as, as was said in court, it was uh, an intelligence-led, but it just was at the same time of the Encro chat um, uh, uh, bust at that time. So it does look like it's another another victory for the old Encro chat hack. Um, I, it, it was quite and the... Where would the information have been coming from in the Encro chat? Well, we do know, like, we, we, we do know that... Um, whatever way that the, the communications between obviously the Irish gangs and the Irish individual who was the, the go-to man to the head of the Chinese gang in Ireland. Now he, he, was, he was named in court as Peng Fei He. Uh, and mm -hmm. he, he actually served time in Ireland. He was, he was caught back in 2015. There was a controlled delivery of drugs that Gardaí went in and uh, posing as a DHL uh, courier. And there was something like 70,000 euro worth of cannabis in one package. He didn't answer. But then they, there was a second one being delivered and he turned up to meet the courier and he admitted to the second package then. And he served, I think he served something like four or five years in prison for it. He initially got eight years and was reduced on appeal. Um, and and one, of the, one of the women that was in court this week, she said the reason she had so much money in the house was that, that this man had paid her back. Because while he was in prison, she had been minding his his wife and kids because they had no income, and again, a lot of this seems to be tied up with, you know, people who who you know arrived into this country. They're, they're they're a little bit vulnerable, like you know, they haven't really made it, or they're possibly illegal, and they're working in poorly paid jobs. Like this lady was working, you know, she was working in a in a nursing home as an assistant, and she was working in a chipper. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, she's had access to a quarter of a million euro in an account, plus there was 117 euro found in another property and 20,000 sterling. And she was driving a, a BMW, all, all of which are a target for the cab. But it, 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 I suppose it shows you how they have these multiple kind of routes of streams of, of ways of trying to launder their money that they're constantly trying to find new ways. And, you know, knowing that every so often one gang is, you know, one money launderer is going to fall to the wayside. I mean, we've seen that with Ryan Hale in, in, in Spain, who, who was busted not so long ago in Spain. And, you know, there, there's always going to be that constant churn. I mean, the money is still flowing. So that presumably these people have already been replaced. So, so, Eamon, was there any details given on where that chipper was, where the woman was working? Uh, the, the, they refer to the affidavits, which I haven't actually got sight of yet. Um, but like the, the businesses themselves do seem to be legit. So I, I, it might be a bit unfair without the, the full affidavits to start naming them. But they were yeah, they yeah. were they were dotted yeah, around and, and like and, and they're not necessarily Chinese restaurants. Some of them are, are just, you know, the regular chippers as well. Uh, yeah. But, at the heart of that story there, that Kieran O'Sullivan that you mentioned. Um, yeah, he has been, um, he also goes by the name Sam O'Sullivan and would be a very sort of a secretive character, I think, within the Kinahan organization. Yeah, we, we've heard that before that, you know, he, he was, a, a, I suppose, a, a posh boy protege of Christy Kinner Sr. who took him very much under his wing. Uh, and we, we know that he, he's been, he, he was actually... Uh, he served time in Spain for cannabis possession and he got a four-year sentence there. And there was mentioned yesterday as well about his arrests in, in, in Holland uh, in regards to amphetamines and guns. So he's not, you know, I suppose in a way he's not a clean skin. He's not somebody that hasn't been heard of by law enforcement, although he wouldn't be, you know, like it took a while, I think, to work out exactly who he was uh, um, from from our point of view, but certainly in, in terms of the general public, I don't think he would have been heard of before. So it, ju it just shows. So, and I don't think he's a very public kind of a figure. Um, you probably having difficulty finding a photograph of him. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> there, that's always an ongoing issue, isn't it? But it, you never know. We make an appeal; someone might send one into us. But he seems to have yeah. have been 
uh, moved from Amsterdam to the, to the south of Spain and been a close associate of Christie Senior during all that time, even though he's more of Daniel's age group and seems to have in the uh, in in the, the the drugs bust in Spain where he is ultimately was convicted. Um, another person with him who was also convicted as part of that was Bernard Clancy, who was one of the the seven people named by the U.S. government and sanctioned. So that's it, that's a really long term strong connection uh, between all those people. And you know, you go back there to two thousand and four, and prior to that, they were jailed. I think in two thousand and four, there was four of them in total, and I think that was on foot of it. You know, I think the car was stopped or something, and this cannabis was found in the car a year previous to that, so you're back to 2003. So that was the early days of the Kinnahans. You had Christy Kinnahan Sr. at that point living up between Amsterdam and Antwerp, and you had Daniel wasn't long out in Spain and the Costa. Um, I believe at that point, Kieran O'Sullivan, the aforementioned stroke Sam O'Sullivan, was out there and was very close with Christy. Um, but in those days, what the Kinahan organization were doing and how they started to make their money out there was they had got a connection with some Moroccan suppliers of cannabis. And they had got that connection and been introduced through the Cocky Warren gang, who was, you know, Curtis Cocky Warren is a Liverpudlian, very well known uh, cocaine multimillionaire. Didn't he end up in the Sunday Times Rich List? Warren. He did. He was um, the first before, ever criminal, yeah, to, to make it. Yeah. Before he was nailed in Holland, actually, in Amsterdam on the phones, he was caught on a wiretap thing. And again, I think there was some high uh, ranking police officers were found to be in his pocket at that time. But it was through his connections in the, in southern Spain, the Kinnahans got this in, basically, with a Moroccan supplier. And the Moroccan supplier was... Um, guaranteeing the landing of the drugs. So they were coming across the straits there in the darkness of night and the drugs were landing on a beach. And at that point, the Kinahan organization under the directorship, really probably of Daniel, you know, under the father, um, they had sort of a system where they used to buy these really expensive fast cars and they would pull the seats out of it and every bit of furniture out of it except the driver's seat. And they would stack the cannabis from the beaches into these cars and get them as quick as possible to warehousing, where they would then divide up the the cannabis and move it onwards up north, up through Europe. Um, And they also had a system that they would move it in trucks, but they had outriders working alongside it. As As the drugs were moving northwards up through Europe, they would have outriders. So if a police car or anything was seen on the highways, one of the outriders would cause a situation to, uh, you know, while the truck safely either pulled off the motorways and waited for a clear route. But just those little things that probably are quite obvious things to do if you're trying to move, you know, multi-million euro container loads of drugs. Um, but that's what they were doing. And the money started really flooding into that Kinahan organization at that around that time. Um, you know, they went on to make 10 times more through cocaine, but definitely cannabis. That's how they started. And he goes all the way back. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, and just, it's, it's an ingenious. He goes all the way back and he's still there. Yeah. Yeah. He's still there as, as Kinahan's middleman with the Chinese in Ireland. And an ingenious little scheme really, isn't it? To to purchase of designer goods. Presumably they had a a lot of people going in and buying these goods as. Yeah. And, and there's something, Something I hadn't heard of before, I'm sure Nicola did, but there's actually a limit on how many um, designer goods you can buy in some of these stores. So if you go in and buy your Louis Vuitton weekend bag for whatever amount of costs mm. that you can only buy three of them in any given, I think it's, a, I'm not sure whether it's a six really? month or a, a 12 month period. So you have to get well, lots of other, you have to get lots of other people. know about that? <laughs> So you obviously have to drag in other people. And the reason, the in, as I buy my T-shirts and H and M just yet, I have to. I admit. don't even have one Louis Vuitton <laughs> bag. Alone three of them get kicked out of Brian Thomas because I want to buy too much designer goods. Exactly. Yeah. So look, it just it it, it was one of these, I suppose, like ant smuggling. It's a, a lot of uh, vulnerable people, or you know, the 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 money mules, whatever. That a, a lot of people are organised and corralled in, in, into doing this, and then. 
you know, they, they do their best to try and identify the head of this particular network. And like Feng Hei Pi is, uh, I mean, they, they're giving evidence about trying to serve him outside the jurisdiction and that sort of stuff. So he's he's flown the coop in, in that regard. Uh, but, you know, I mean, the last time he was in court, uh, you know, for the drugs, he was very much described. There was no sign of luxury or, you know, living a, living a high lifestyle that he hadn't come to the attention mm. of the guards before. So it does sound like a lot of these people are very much, um, you know, they're being exploited by people much further up the line that this money was being sent on to China. Uh, now, whether, it, you know, it's obviously the Irish drugs gang's money. So whether or not then that money then is, is drawn down somewhere in the UAE or whether it's in Spain or, or Antwerp or, you know, wherever, the, you know, again, it feeds into that, you know, the similar, the underworld banking, similar to the, the Huawei system, except it's, you know, it, again, it's a, it's another one based on a, on a particular ethnicity, um, which is... You, you, the money laundering side of it all is just exhausting, isn't it? I mean... <laughs> God almighty, the amount of scams you'd have to cook up and, and do and just actually laundering that kind of money. Are we still talking, is it all still done in cash now? Are they still, you know, aren't drug dealers down the scale revoluting now and things like that? Like, yeah, I mean, is I th- it going to make make life easier for them if people can? I mean, I mean, there must be so many ways, and I'm sure. Like, I mean, we we know, like, whenever it was 25 years ago, John Gilligan was putting all the bets on and all the races in a particular betting shop in Lucan. So, I mean, why can't some of these guys now, with the money they have, you know, pick on a an, you know a small stock exchange somewhere in in the Western world, and you know, pump and dump a couple of shares, and you know, they claim that they made you know two billion from this investment when the whole thing was a sham. I mean, it's it's not beyond possibility, and I'm sure it does oh, happen. I mean, I, even this week there was a guard raid in in Mead where, you know, there wasn't a lot of details given out, but it was to do with cryptocurrency. I mean, that that must be a way cryptocurrency. I know they've they've plummeted in value, and people have obviously lost a lot of money. But as a method of money laundering, it must be really it's designed for that nearly some cryptocurrency because of the fact it's not centralized so that must really be the future of 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 you know that type of money laundering activity you can see how that would be just so attractive you'll have to get a ticket and explain blockchain theory because it's actually the opposite it's supposed to make it extremely traceable which i think criminals don't necessarily know (laughs) well well maybe so but i mean it's they they you know they're it's still not centralized, so I think is the attraction for them, isn't it? And we do know that they've created farming, you know, like these Bitcoin mines, entire farms of them, where they've, you know, used up half the electricity of a small city yeah. to try and mine up a few more uh, Bitcoins or doggy coins, whatever they're called. But it's a, uh, but I mean, I they must still like bricks and mortar, like most human beings, you know, that really feels safe, doesn't it, with, with your money? Um, I'm sure they like diamonds too. I'd feel pretty safe at a handful of diamonds or gold bars, but you know. But you still have to, I like, you, you know, when, when, comfortable buying into the cryptocurrency when I can't see it and touch it. And, you know, uh, I don't think I'm alone. No, I think, well, you see, with Christy Kinnahan Sr., as you said, has always been a step above, but they've really, he seems to have really tried to diversify his wealth into a load of areas. So if one of them does go down, you know, the others still stand, I think. But they obviously felt yeah. comfortable putting their name to properties in Dubai, which came out of those leaked documents that came out. They actually bought properties in their own name or in the names of their partners at the very least. Mm. Uh, so they obviously felt that that was, you know, that was going to, that was safe. Um, whether yeah. whether it'll prove to be or not in the end, it's, it's, it's not clear. Did something happen with the Americans? They were... Well, they, they you said you said earlier now there was the ambassador or something was asked to yeah, there a was, question in relation to Kinahan's. Yeah, there was a, basically a, you know they they were publicly making their feelings known that the process was proving very slow in terms of bringing the Kinahan's to justice, and I think it does put pressure on the officials in Dubai that that the American government or representative of the American government would speak so openly about it. Um, it just shows that that you know it's one thing for for the Irish how much leverage we can exert over over places like the Gulf, but the Americans it still must uh, it must put them under real pressure. 
So, I mean, they're still on the case and they're still willing to answer about mm. it publicly. But as 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 you said recently here, and it's always uh, also the Irish Times also reference it, the fact that Sean McGovern is still, you know, there's there's clearly a warrant out for him. You know, it's a serious crime of murder is yeah. what he's being investigated for. And um, by all accounts, he's still in Dubai. And the fact he hasn't been picked up, you know, shows that something is not fully working or the cooperation there is obviously some issue there and and the fact that Liam Byrne was so swiftly picked up in Spain just shows you that the authorities either here or in Spain are ready to move you know when they have warrants but I mean obviously people. the warrant was there and he wasn't there was no sign of extradition from Dubai to the UK mm. to face those charges that way for him to leave so you'd, w- you'd wonder if there's an element of you don't know what to do really to please the the Emirates you know is it because we're looking for them too strongly? You know, if you say nothing, if, you, if you're quieter about it, maybe is that a better way? Do they feel as if we're not going to do what you tell us to do? We'll do it in our own good time. There's so many cultural differences, really. Um, it seems like, you know, certainly in The Hague, um, in Europe, Paul, there's now a representative from Dubai and, um, you know, they feel... From a policing point of view, we're getting places slowly, um, but I'd say it's a, there's a, an element of that kind of um, they're the big boys and you don't tell them what to do. I mean, I do think I'd be very confident the Kinnahans are going to be picked up. I think they're very confident themselves they're going to be picked up. I'd be pretty confident Daniel Kinnahan would be headed for home soon enough. But you just don't know what to do right in Dubai. You know, when you're you're trying to follow the rules and the laws and, you know. Um, but sure, like, I mean, look, sure, we've seen it again and again that, that, that countries don't like necessarily being pushed around. Uh, certainly Saudi Arabia have reacted to American pressure in, in various ways over on a, a much bigger scale over the last couple of years in terms of the war in, in Yemen and their role in it. So they, they there has been a bit of a pushback from some of these countries um, mm. some of these Gulf states about uh, where even Joe Biden was asked, you know, talking about oil prices and that was rejected. So there, there are other broader tensions that are uh, not worth going into on Crime World, I suppose. Stay out of our lane, as somebody told us recently about. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe maybe we need to be getting into that lane because certainly yeah. if, we, if we ask the uh, Italian justice minister who went to Dubai and, you know, shortly afterwards, Raphael Imperiale was on a plane home. Was, was. So I, I think it needs that level of political intervention. Yeah. So, I mean, doesn't need Helen McEntee yeah. to fly out there and have a, a one-on-one with her counterpart and say, look, we, we need your help, please, or whatever the way about it is. Yeah. You know whether it's uh, yeah, yeah. I think what happened with Imperiale was he was he was arrested and then the initial extradition hearing sort of failed for whatever reason some technicality and in the in the middle of that after that initial failure the Italian uh, justice minister flew over and then it did happen you know so that was obviously mm. a, a good intervention. Mm. Well, we we'll see whether we need to intervene or not. So, anything else on the agenda? No, that's... Or can I go and have a glass of wine? You can go and have a glass of wine or visit whatever Fringe? coffee shop you want. <laughs> a couple of chocolate brownies. <laughs> well, I, I'm actually in Brussels now, so there isn't any of that nonsense here. It's a far more suave city altogether. And the coffee shops you go into, you could have a chocolate brownie, of course, but it would just be the same as the ones we get at home. <laughs> there you go, Nicola. <laughs>